It's the big one, Gary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is he? He's the he is the guitar hero's hero. The daddy of British guitar. I mean, if if you if you ask any of the big guitarists from the seventies, you know your Gilmores and your Townsends and whoever, they'll all say one man, Hank Marvin. Uh, that's and if you go through, you will see. I don't think there's practically no guitarists who you can't find a photo of playing a red strap at some point. And of course, he has the first red strap to ever come into the country. Or we think he has it. Maybe he doesn't have it anymore. He might not have it. We also are not quite sure what the colour is. <laughs> the official colour. Yeah, but exactly. um, no, let's, let, you know, people do forget about, about the Shadows and, the Clif- and Cliff Ridgen and the Shadows and how they were the first British rock and roll band. And we are here today to discover that story. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. You know, what people forget about Bowie is that he was such a kind man. Remember me? I'm in a band now. (laughs) It's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. Get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Hank. Hello. Hello, Hank. Can you hear us? Hey, Hank. Beautifully, thank you. Oh, Fantastic. wow. Fantastic. We are talking from three different time zones. It's <laughs> <laughs> How the Great world has of- changed. Yeah, we, we've just gone into lockdown this evening in Perth. Oh no. oh, no, but Australia was a sort of beacon to the world of... How well, well you were what's handling that, it. What's happened is um, some security guard who was working in a hotel where they had two or three quarantined people has contracted the British variant. And they believe it's from one of the quarantined individuals. They don't know how it happened. Everywhere he's been in the last two or three days, like oh. one hour here, two hour oh. day, you know, everyone's rushing around to get tested. And they, they put us on lockdown from six o'clock for five days, but I suspect it'll go on longer. Oh, no. Um, they've asked everyone not to panic buy, you know, because there's going to be plenty of, you can go and do your shopping. What happens? Queues, queues everywhere, supermarkets. Yeah. People, you know, cheek to jowl. Who no knew space. we needed stock, that much toilet stock, paper? Stock, yeah, or those I, many the Tim, stock. they're stocking up on Tim Tams, are they, Hank? <laughs> what are Tim Tams? They're a sort of chocolate biscuit wafer. Um, Australian. I'm, I'm four and twenties, yeah. I'm up on. I spent a lot of time in Australia, Hank, so I'm quite up on my. Yeah, the old tin. <laughs> They're a bit like the penguin biscuits, aren't they? That's yeah, yeah, not not as good, but probably not. But they've got a variety of flavours. I I don't eat them personally. <laughs> you look amazing, Hank. It must be said. I want to. You must have the portrait in the attic. <laughs> and he's drinking champagne. No, actually, it was. It's it's a drop of prosecco we had left. And I thought it would cheer me up before we come on. Not that I need cheering up, but you know. oh, yeah, oh, gr- oh great! You, well, you do look it's amazing. A very cheerf- it's a cheerful interview, Hank. We want to cheer. I mean, it's we are so honoured and excited to be doing this. Are you eighty yet? Is has that happened? Uh, I'll be this year, yeah, I'll be eighty this year. I, I'm a, I'm basically a year behind Cliff. And have you had your jab? Which one? For oh, the, the, the coronavirus. <laughs> Not yet. We're not getting ours available till I think the end of this month, beginning of March. But at our age, obviously, we're we're lined up for it, you know. So, you know, you are, every guitarist that's happened since the 60s and 70s, after you, everybody refers to you. And I mean, everybody, the greats. I um, I, uh, I, uh, had a quick chat with Pete Townsend this week, who said, just say to Hank, I love him, but he knows that. Uh-huh. Not to get competitive or anything, but I had a word with David Gilmore, <laughs> who said to send, <laughs> who said to send you his very best. And I did actually say, "Do would you have a question?" Um, for how, he's, firstly, he said, "What an incredible influence you are on him." He said he once asked you what delay unit you used, and you couldn't remember. Um, if that if that's a question he wants answered, and it depends on which period he's talking about, the the original. Yeah, the original Echo Box was um, marketed in the UK by Vox, but it was actually a Miati Echo Box, which I understand, again, Miati was simply the marketing retailer's name. It wasn't the name of the manufacturer. Um, I'll tell you who introduced me to that box. Do you remember a really old guy called Joe Brown? Yes. <laughs> of course, of yes, course. And Sam, course. his daughter, was on tour I, 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 Yeah, and me. You guy. And she toured with Pink Floyd. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, well, Joe, I mean, he's a lovely guy, Joe, and we, we used to have a laugh together when we used to meet up from time to time. Uh, back in 1959, we were appearing, you know, this was towards the very end of the, the um, variety days. So you still had a few variety theatres in operation, one of which was in Manchester, uh, in Liverpool, Liverpool Empire. And we, we were doing a week there, Cliff and the Drifters, I think we were still called then, just before we changed our name. And uh, Jack Good, who then was a TV producer yeah. and director who did Oh Boy Show and Boy Meets Girl. He was doing Boy Meets Girl from Manchester. And he called Cliff up and said, look, we've got Gene Vincent on the show. Do you want to come over and meet him? So we all <laughs> shot over there. And while we were sort of surrounding Gene Vincent in admiration, uh, Joe Brown pulled me to one side. And he said, I want to show you something. And he showed me this. It was only about so big. So deep, a box with a few dials on the front, couple of knobs. And he gave me his guitar and said, try this. And the first echo that it had on there was the typical rock and roll tape echo, which sounded amazing. You know, that's the, the echo you get on stage, you know, to sound like a, the old rock and roll record. So I was knocked out with that. Then I, I discovered very quickly that it had multi heads. So by depending which group of heads you chose and... Uh, which uh, speed, et cetera, you could get these tripping, tumbling echoes. Right, which right, right. Oh, like the Benson, like the Benson echo. That was, yeah. Yeah, well, that's right. The Benson was uh, a later um, addition yeah. to the market. And I, f I went on to Benson's for a while because the, the, <laughs> the problem with this uh, Vox was that it had a little a flat drum around which you put a quarter inch tape. Okay, so it's just, it's actually yeah. recording on the tape. But of course, you had to splice the tape, and if the tape wasn't quite correctly spliced, you got us like. Doop, 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 doop. Plus, uh, it was very noisy, incredibly noisy. Yeah. You know, it, which you didn't hear when we were playing, but obviously, a gap in the music when you're talking, you heard this sort of <laughs> noise going on. <laughs> you know, obviously, you were inspired by someone, but what you were doing then ended up. Certainly, with Sid Barrett taking that up, and 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 David Gilmore himself, that delay sound that you were helping to create in your in your style, became very very popular in the in the seventies, and and still is. Where did you get it from? Because I'm trying to look at the timeline here of the history of your influence, and I and I come up with Dwayne Eddy, who apparently couldn't get a reverb satisfied factually into a studio so he bought a water tank and dragged it into the studio to put his amp in but there's and then there's also um dick dale doing the surf music yes. surf guitar they all sound kind of similar to what you were doing and then of course there was the guitarist that was that was with cliff before ian ian sampson right samwell samwell thank you samwell yeah what what where was your influences coming from well my influences in the rock and roll world were the early rock players. Uh, Gene Vincent's guitarist, Cliff Gallup, wonderful player, cracking solos. Uh, James Burton, Scotty Moore, yeah. Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, all, you know, those twanging guitar sounds. And um, uh, as you probably are aware, in some of those early records, the Gene Vincent stuff and um, Elvis Presley, they use a lot of that slap echo. Once having heard that, there was the this strong desire to try to achieve that, not just on, on record if possible, but live. And this echo box gave me the opportunity. But the most important thing about that was not so much that short um, tape echo, like uh, the old rock echo, was this tumbling multi-head echo, which I used on most of our recordings, not the same setting, like for example, Apache. It's a pretty over the top echo going on as things like Wonderful Land, but, I hated this sort of dry guitar sound that some people were getting. To me, it had no life in it. I wanted to hear the, the, this, the guitar singing more and the echo helped to sustain the guitar a little bit. So it, it was just a sound which excited me and it, it was purely by accident really that one, I came across the echo box two, I started to fiddle around with it and started to use it. And the combination of that, the whammy bar and the Strat and the, um, the Vox amp just kind of all fell together. And suddenly I had a sound and a style which was strongly influenced by the use of the whammy bar and the echo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you if you if you uh, if you've got a delay going and then you play with the whammy bar, which which bends the note, you get this wonderful chorus effect that's starting to happen. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, guys, right? We need to go back to Newcastle. Yes. 
So what was it? So you started with Bruce playing skiffle, right? <laughs> what did you first hear to do that? Was that Elvis or? No skiffle. No. Well, when I was around 14, well, 15, Donnegan. I used to listen to a lot of uh, what we eventually called traditional jazz, New Orleans, Chicago jazz. And I had uh, about two records. That's all I had. Then I got into folk music. Well, not so much folk blues, work songs like uh, Lead Billy, Big Bill Brunzi, Josh White, Sonny uh, Terry Brown and McGee, uh, those sort of people. Yeah. And um, then Lonnie came on the scene and his early stuff, I could see the connection straight away between the work songs and these folk blues things and what he was doing. And it turned out Lonnie was a bit of a fan of uh, Lead Billy as well. And Lonnie Johnson, of course. And um, so I, I got into the skiffle thing. I had my own little group at school and uh, we were big earners. We used, to, we used to go out on Friday night, five of us, searching for a youth club and they were always joining a church and we used to uh i'd go in and, and ask if we could come and play for them and we'd play about 20 minutes and we'd get a cup of tea and a biscuit we thought that was fantastic nothing much has changed as you know gary that's still what we get <laughs> i came to school one day and a group of guys probably about eight ten of them in a little tight group and sticking out above this group i could see the headstock of a guitar which immediately attracted me. So I rushed over and it was Bruce. Bruce Welsh was there and he had a, a metal body guitar. Would that be a national or a Dobro, Gary? No, either. Either of those. That's either, isn't it? I can't believe he had one of those though. Yeah. Where did I'm, he get that? He probably stole it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I have no idea. I have no idea. But I'm interested um, in this skiffle thing because, because it, it seems uniquely sort of, British and, and 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 it's the it's white music, but there's it's based a lot in 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 black, um, yes. blues as well. What's it's where does it come from? Is it country, and also obviously the kind of instruments that kids were playing was that just because they couldn't afford real instruments? You know, sort of boxes with strings on. Oh, the teacher's it, face. Yeah, really. yeah, it's a sort of do-it-yourself ethic that punk had later on, really, isn't it? Was yes, it? yes. And that T-chess bass was interesting because uh, you know, there were no real notes coming out of it. Well, that's perhaps yeah. wrong. There were notes, but there were not necessarily notes in the key in which we were all playing. <laughs> so it, it didn't matter. It was just boom, 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 you know, noise at the bottom of the uh, register. Um, for me, Skipper was simply uh, British people trying to do a version of what you mentioned, Gary, uh, music that came from the back, uh, from the black community in, in the south of yeah. the USA songs, folk, blues, etc. And then Lonnie, his first album was very much that in terms of the content. Then he started doing things like, you know, does your chewing gum lose its flavor? flavor. Which apparently does, of course. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, he, you know, he, he got away from it a little bit. What a great performer Lonnie was, though. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, of course, John Lennon was in the other, you know, famous other great skiffle yeah. band, the, the Quarry Men. So what was yours, your band was called with Bruce? The one with Bruce is called the Railroaders. Of course, it has to have something to do with the train, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> well, because then, because you, because uh, you, you got into a skiffle competition in London. Yes, yes. Uh, funny enough, I, I want to know what what competition that was. Well, it was. I think it was the Stanley Dale skiffle uh, skiffle competition. Stanley Dale, I think, was a promoter. And do you remember an artist called Jim Dale who became an actor? He, yeah, of, course, of course, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. You might, I think. Still around. Well, Jim Dale toured as the star with that hit record, and he did about a 20-minute spot. And the rest of the show was a talent competition, skiffle groups. And uh, we ended up getting in the finals, and we, which were in London at the Edmonton Granada. And we all shot down to London, you know, full of confidence. And we, we came third, actually, uh, which was... Who won? <laughs> Well, funny enough, it, at the end of the day, it turned out to be more of a talent competition because the guy who won was a, a, an opera singer, an amateur opera singer from somewhere like the Philippines or somewhere like that. So, <laughs> right. You was robbed. <laughs> you was robbed, mate. This is, and, and you decided to stay, right? You found someone who'd put you up? Mr. Livingstone. <laughs> uh, he was a Scotsman, but uh, he was very fond of us, come from Newcastle, as he thought it was almost Scotland. And uh, <laughs> he was touch with a Geordie lady who had a um, theatrical digs. And we, we, we were there for probably, ended up staying there for about six months. How, how did you eat? 
Well, do because you were you were playing you and talk, stuff. You know, hands, hands, <laughs> hands, mouth. No, 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 no. <laughs> How do you eat, guy? <laughs> <laughs> How could you afford to live? A very complicated system of pulleys and winches. Uh, Uh, In (laughs) fact, quite honestly, we the first few weeks were difficult because we we had no money, and um, by the time we pay the rent, we sometimes went two or three days without eating, literally without eating. And I, I I reckon that's why I'm so skinny. But anyway. We, we finally did start a work and we, we ended up working down the two ice coffee bar in the cellar. Right, right. Now, I know Guy's going to come in with quite a fascinating this, point story. This is where things get interesting. Uh, can I believe at one point you played with, a, with the, the Vipers, Wally Whiten's band? I did. Well, here's where it gets interesting for me, because as you said, you worked in the basement, which had actually been painted, it had a mural, it was painted by Lionel Bart and his songwriting partner, Mike Lionel, Pratt. Can I, just, can I just add, Lionel Bart wrote Oliver, etc. Yes, and, uh, sorry, I spoke over you. Uh, yeah, and more, and more importantly, the two of them, uh, Lionel and Mike, uh, wrote Tommy Steele's first. They wrote Rock, Rock with the Caveman and all of his songs. Elevated and Mike Pratt. Pratt was my dad. Oh, how about that? I don't know if you ever came across him. He would have been a bit older than you, but they were part of the original Two Eyes scene. Yeah. So did he, did he, uh, did he, he I, painted I that room, did he? Yeah, they painted it yeah, for I a case of beer. I don't remember meeting for a case of beer. Don't remember meeting y- your dad, but uh, yeah. met Lionel a few times. Used to hang around the, like the freight train, freight train coffee bar. Lionel, of course, wrote "Living Doll," which was Cliff's That's right, first of course. number. Yeah. C- can I just concentrate on that two eyes scene? Because for anyone who doesn't know, this is this is the birthplace of British rock and roll. Nothing in Britain would have happened if it hadn't been for that coffee bar in Old Compton yeah. Street in Soho. Two eyes, I think, because apparently there were two brothers. Um, two Iran, Australian brothers. Irani? Irani brothers. I think that was Irani correct, brothers. Yeah. Originally you owned it, but then but then it was then it was a couple of Australian wrestlers or something who ended up managing right, it. Yeah. But but it's where Tommy Steele started, and obviously where you and Cliff started. We'll get on to that story. But you know, and Tommy- fact, sorry, just one little bit of trivia as as even the doorman was Peter Grant, who went on to be Led Zeppelin's manager. Wow. Wow. But 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 Tommy Tommy Steele and you, obviously, this is the beginnings of rock and roll. If you if you if you the first so-called rock and roll British record may well have been rocking with the cavemen, Tommy Steele, or it may have been Move It, Cliff Richard. I mean, I think Move It is actually more rock and roll than from out of the two of them. But you know, Tommy found rock and roll Ooh. because he was a sailor, wasn't he? He was down at yeah. he, he was he he found it in Virginia Navy, yeah. on a boat, and he found this person that would influence you was probably the reason you wore those glasses, Buddy Holly, and he brought the first Buddy Holly rock and roll, but uh, Buddy Holly records back to the UK. I mean, what a scene! Did did, did you ever? What part of that were you in, Hank? Well, obviously, once we got to London, they, keep in mind in those days everything was. In, in the music industry was centralized. It was all in London. Agents, recording studios. We didn't have that kind of uh, provincial thing that developed in, in, the, in the 60s and through the 70s. And as it turned out, we, like you're saying, you know, we were attracted to the two eyes because we'd heard this was the place to be. This is where everything was, was happening. So we finally started to work down there. I don't know if you've ever been down there, Gary and Guy, but this, it was a very small cellar. No, I mean, and, I think it had closed uh, by the time it's we... It's long, 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 long gone. I can't remember what it is now. It's, I don't know, probably... It's a fish and chip shop. Time, it was a, a French restaurant last time I was there. And the stage at the end was only deep enough to fit a drum kit. So all the musicians stood in a line. Drum kit, right? So if you're looking at the stage, drum kit was on your left. Then, the, you know, the guitarists and the, the, the bass and the singers and so forth in a line. And it was great fun. So we, we had the opportunity then to meet a lot of different um, ambitious young people who wanted to be singers or musicians in their various forms. I remember one young guy used to go down there. He, he liked to play the piano and he'd come down in the afternoon to write songs. And he was, cut. I, I had bad acne, but this guy was a world champion. <laughs> he, and he, he used to write these terrible songs the, the title of one was She's Just a Tart with the Lads. We, <laughs> My God. <laughs> Similar yeah. times. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're all kind of great guys down there, you know, that used to come in some good... You'd get some pros like... I hope that um, wasn't my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and who was this guy? Did What did he, get, what did he go on to write? Yeah, he had a sort of Russian-sounding surname. All right. 
Uh, I think it might have been Putin. <laughs> <laughs> In that case, he's the greatest songwriter who ever lived. <laughs> so, so, so I guess Tommy was one of the reasons you were down there as well. The the, the Tommy Tommy Steele influence. Oh, look, sure, sure. Uh, the fact that. Well, I say it's a fact, I'm not sure if it is a fact, but we were led to believe that Tommy was discovered there, Terry Dean was discovered there. Mm -hmm. So this was the place to be. So hence we all gravitated like bees to a honeypot around this place. And uh, that's uh, we, we first met Mickey Most down there. You remember Mickey, the record producer? Yeah, yeah, yes, course, absolutely. Course, I, course. Yes, I worked with him, yeah. Well, Mickey in those days was a singer. He was part of a double act called the Most Brothers, Mickey and Alex. In that's fact, they... Right, yeah. They were on the first tour we did with Cliff, and I, I used to play for them on that tour. Uh, Jet Harris, myself, were, were in that band that accompanied them on the tour. And then, of course, Mickey went off to South, got married, went to South Africa, became a star there, came back, and became a wonderful record producer. But let's go, let's go back to this bit where you get pr pretty much discovered and and introduced to Cliff, because this is the breaking point. Is that, so? You, this is the point where you break as an artist. Into the into the world you really want you and Bruce at the same time. Yeah, well, how that worked out, I was there one afternoon at the two eyes with a girl called Rick Richards, who uh, was a country singer who used to play a lot down the two eyes, and we were approached by a tall young guy, that, and they, they obviously knew each other. They start talking, and he introduced me, and then this guy was John Foster, who was uh, Cliff's first manager, and he said he was looking for Tony Sheridan because Cliff was about to do his first professional tour, he needed a lead guitarist. He heard Tony Sheridan was good. So Didn't Rick said- quarry, in the in the quarry men, Tony Sheridan? Uh, later in, I don't know when was it was- he something to do with the Beatles? No, he did a lot of work in Germany and the Beatles backed him. Ah, that's right. That's right, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. it, yeah. yeah. So anyway, Rick, long story short, Rick said, look, he said, you should listen to this guy, because he, he, he taught Tony everything, which was not entirely true, but, what happened was when we went to the two eyes initially, Tony was a singer, you know, he would be singer, strumming and guitar. And he didn't play any lead stuff. And he used to ask me how, how I played certain solos that I'd learned from records. And I'd show him and he was a very quick learner. So anyway, we went down to the cellar, got our guitars out and we played a few rock tunes. And John said, that's great. If you want the job, you've got the job. And I said, do you need a rhythm guitarist? He said, well, funny enough, yes. So I recommended Bruce, which is probably the biggest mistake I've ever made in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, a couple of days later, we met Cliff in Old Compton Street. Uh, he was being fitted for this oh, famous big yeah. jacket, you know. And uh, uh, living like stars, we got a Green Line bus and drove up to Chesham and rehearsed in his parents' front room in the council house. Amazing. Fantastic. Uh, what would you have been using then for, for a tour like that? Because that's the thing, you know, it's the days for monitors or anything like that. What would you have had amp-wise and stuff? Well, as you say, there were no things like monitors. It, you, everyone used the house PA system. Uh, we had, I had a tiny little Selma ramp, which was probably about, I don't know, maybe 18 inches high. And uh, it, not very loud, as you can appreciate. And I then had, it was a very old 1940s guitar. It was black, very small bodied. Yeah, I actually got it on loan from a guy who used to be in the Skiffle Group, a guy called Eddie Silver from Newcastle. And he, he, he let me borrow it when he went back to Newcastle. And then it ended up in Bruce's hands. I think, again, he stole it. Yeah. Something, about, yeah. something about a theme emerging here. <laughs> yes. I'm getting, really bad. I'm getting to that later. We need to yeah. get onto that guitar in a minute. That yeah. famous, yeah. famous yeah. guitar. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but who was Cliff to you? What did, was Cliff, had Cliff already had, he'd already had this record out, hadn't he? Move it. When, when you, when yeah, you we, we heard it on the jukebox and the two eyes and we thought, wow, what a fab record. And I assumed it was an American record. Uh, and obviously we learned it very quickly and started going down the two eyes. And so that was great. I didn't know who Cliff was. All I'd seen was, I knew he had the record. It was coming up the charts. I'd seen a photograph. He looked pretty cool, like a young rocker. And that's all I knew about him. Yeah, because you know, people do forget, Hank, the importance of Cliff in, in the story of rock and roll in Britain. Because, uh, you know, given what, you know, Cliff became, uh, you know, the and is, you know, this great sort of variety singer, if you like, um, 
you know, John Lennon himself said something like, you know, there was, it all began with Move It and Cliff Richard and The Shadows and, uh, and there was nothing else before. You are the very beginning of this story. I think, um, first of all, we, just getting back to Cliff, when we met Cliff, we, we, we quickly grew to like each other. We had similar taste in music and comedy, et cetera, et cetera. And we just got on. He was easy to get on with. He was very polite. He wasn't a, a flash guy, you know, very humble at the time. Not to say he isn't now, but, you know, constantly <laughs> record coming up the charts. And um, we just hit it off. And he was so knocked out with the, with, with the way things were working musically that he asked us to stay on after the tour. But if just a quick flashback to the first night of the tour, Hanley Victoria Hall, October the 5th, 1958. 58. And the Kalen twins are top of the bill. So Cliff comes on, and before he, sorry, before he comes on, he's announced by the compere, and the, the place almost fell apart with the noise. We just look, what's going on here, you know? It came on, and it was just nonstop screaming, and we, we simply couldn't hear ourselves play. There was no way in the world. We, we started to get close to the kit, you know, the drum kit to make sure we're actually playing together. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was a wild tour, um, you know, hundreds of kids in the street every night after him. And it's clear he had something really special. Even at that age, you know, as, as a, a novice, he knew how to work the crowd and, and it, it really got them going. So that was but, fun. Yeah. So I think I digress, Gary. You were so, But those something. were very much, those tours were all, were package tours, weren't they? They were very much, it was, it was the variety model. Still, exactly. Wasn't it? So you were only paying like 15, 20 minutes. Which, once was, you started was, having bands, it must have been really, with everyone's gear getting on and off, must have been quite... <laughs> <laughs> did you have the Buddy Holly glasses by then as well, Hank? I, I did, sort of, yes. I, I And also, it, as a matter of financial interest, I earned more money on that too than Cliff did. It was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was paying me. Uh, the most brothers were paying me. And I did a number with the Kalen twins, and they paid me. <laughs> Not much, but it just worked out. I, 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 you know, we had a bit of a laugh about it. As a little aside, sorry, it's because you said when when you first got together, you got together, you you had the same taste in comedy and stuff. Now, is that like the goons? Is that, that would have been yeah, the, the goons, uh, yeah. Tony Hancock, uh, you know, all that. Ah, there stuff. you go. It's funny though because comedy was really important for bands then. I mean, people forget about the, yeah. that how important comedy was in the Beatles. You know, the goons were as big as influence on them as as, as Little Richard. Well, that a comedy uh, producer, didn't they? But but also, you know, because you, you did, and later on, you were doing something very similar. You know, you were making those films, those comedy rock and roll films that the Beatles went on and made. In fact, they yeah. probably wouldn't have made those movies if it hadn't been for the ones you guys were making at the beginning. The first time we saw the Beatles live, uh, we had just come back from the tour of uh, Africa, and I noticed that their second single, "Please Please Me," was number two in the charts. I went, "Wow, that's great! Got to." hear this because I love Love Me Do It. It was a cracking record. And uh, we realized they were on tour. There was Chris Montez who had the number one hit. He was top of the bill. Tommy Rowe and the Beatles were third on the bill. So Bruce and I went to see them at uh, somewhere like Walthamstow, Granada or something. Place was half empty. They came, no one screamed, not one scream. And, wow. and they were fooling around, like you're saying, you know, John doing a slightly sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. twist, you know. And, and uh, But I just love the rawness of their sound. And we, we, we went up and saw them afterwards and they came back to Bruce's place after the gig uh, and we got the guitars out. We sang a lot of rock and roll songs then. Wow. They sang us some of their new songs and we sang some songs that we'd written. But I'll tell you what, theirs was so much better than ours. I got <laughs> knitting. But what was the timeline, um, Hank? Had you already made those films with with uh, by then with with Cliff? Had you done solo? Have you had you done your instrumental Shadows records by then? Uh, because you said you had these two double careers going on, didn't you? You were you were yeah. Cliff Richard in the Shadows. You were also writing for Cliff to to some extent, and then and then you had this instrumental band, The Shadows, that were having number ones. Yeah, that was a bit weird because um, obviously working with Cliff, we, we were now very experienced in the studio. That was important. You know, we we've done such a lot of recording. Uh, we felt pretty confident of being in a studio. What we had to do, how we had to approach it. And um, as regards the instrumentals, we didn't really see ourselves as an instrumental band. We, we got the recording contract because of singing harmonies and playing pretty much as 
the Beatles would do later. And uh, it was purely by chance that we were offered this wonderful instrumental by Jerry Lorden, who was on tour with us in, in 1960, and, uh, it, which was Apache. And uh, we, this is a fantastic piece of music. It was so different, very evocative, full of atmosphere. So we, we, we arranged it and because uh, he had no arrangement. He used to just sing on it. He had a little ukulele and he'd strum the chords. And Who was he? Who was he? Down, down, down. And that's the way it was. So, yeah, so we suddenly had a big hit record. Cliff, incidentally, played on that record too. He played like a, an African drum. Did he? Oh, wow. That sound on the intro with the boom, 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 boom. It's a combination of me and Tony and Tom's, the bass, and Cliff's... Uh, Chinese oh, wow. drum. Also, could I say, Hank, one thing is going back as it's been a fantastic rabbit hole being down for the last week of, of going through all your stuff, is um, the sound of those records, right? Sonically, just in terms of recording and stuff, is so good. It's like they could have been recorded yesterday. When you compare <laughs> what records went on to sound like in the 60s, just, just technically, they were, they're amazing. They're so beautifully clean and... You know, the fidelity is fantastic. What, what do you put that down to? Just it's probably drugs. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't touch that stuff. I'll tell you what, though, we had a great recording engineer, Malcolm Addy. Yeah. He was really good. Is that Abbey and Road? He, yes. Uh, Malcolm used to work a lot with uh, Nori Paramo, who's the record Nori producer. Paramo, right. Who, yeah. And, and Malcolm was the engineer. Then we, then Peter, when, when Malcolm le left and went to go to, the, he had an offer in the States, so he went over to the USA. Uh, Peter Vince took over about 1964 or five, maybe. But Malcolm said something to me one day, which I thought was interesting. He said, I had a call from um, a, a producer. He's recording an instrumental and he wants to know how we get what he thinks is a big sound on your records. And he's using a lot of instruments, you know, like drums and percussion and keyboards and two or three guitars and so forth and so forth. And Malcolm said one of the secrets is quite honestly, he said it's just it's the small group. It's you can hear everything and it sounds bigger because you're hearing each instrument come through. We never played too loud in the studio. Some some of the early records, a couple of records, we we sort of got into a slight bit of distortion. We did a thing called shotgun, which was a little, a little distorted, and and man of mystery is is definitely yeah. boring on that. But generally, because I often wondered about that. Yeah, sorry, because no, I often wondered about that. Even with your early lamp, with your little Selma, did you not notice when you cranked it right up that it would distort? Did you not think, hang on, <laughs> it's quite a good sound. Let me let me yeah, come exactly. up with a riff. <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. well, <laughs> the problem was in those things that if you did anything like that, and it was yes, there might be a hint of distortion, but if it got into serious distortion. Yeah. It was just, whoa, what's wrong with the amp? You know, it, it, people didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but this, I think the sound, I think the, what Guy's talking about and the clarity and the beauty of it really is your guitar. Because if you try and listen to the backing track on those instrumentals, Apache or FBI, you know, they're quite, they're quite condensed in a way, quite simple. But out front is this wonderful guitar sound. Now, you were playing on the famous Fender Strat, and we have to discuss this because this... Yeah, yeah. In history is so important. I mean, we all know David Gilmore plays a, a Fender Strat. He just sold it for how much no, did he all, sell it for? That was three point six million. But all the Pink Floyd tours I did, he was playing a red Strat. But but the Stratocaster the is so important in the history of rock and roll. And uh, it, you know, obviously, your inspiration to play this script, uh, Stratocaster um, to play one was was Buddy Holly. Um, tell tell me two things. Tell me about Buddy Holly and why he's so important in rock and roll. And tell and to you and tell me. What, how did you end up with the first Stratocaster ever to come into Britain? Yeah. Okay, well, with Buddy, uh, the first record I heard that uh, I didn't even know who it was at the time was That'll Be The Day on a jukebox in, in Newcastle. And it just sounded incredible. You know, this mono sound, a lot of bottom end on it, and, and the guitar sounded so... That introduction was so fabulous. And and Buddy had a, a, an unusual way of singing, didn't he? That little hiccuping style he had. Yeah. Uh, and... Mm -hmm. That made a big impact. And, and then almost immediately, I wanted to hear what else he was doing. I loved the sound of his voice. I loved the guitar. Then I found out he wore glasses. And I thought, I hope he has acne. Because then, you know, <laughs> then we're, we're pals. But anyway, uh, I, I just thought he was uh, sensational. You know, um, he, he came up with some good rock and roll songs. He, he had a good guitar sound. He had a distinctive voice. And I think he gave hope to guys like me who were 
skinny and wore glasses that you didn't have to look like Elvis yeah. Presley or. But there's also uh, okay. I want to get guitar nerdy here because there's a thing about the color, isn't it? Because you is supposedly Fiesta red, but it wasn't known as Fiesta. It's the color it was known as salmon pink over here, or <laughs> so. What actually was it? Well, for some reason, Bruce, Cliff, and myself, when we poured over the vendor catalog, because just to uh, a bit of explanation about that, you couldn't buy new American instruments in the UK in 1959. There was still an embargo on. They didn't get lifted, I think, till what, the end of 1960 yes. or something? Wow, I never knew that. Yeah, what was that? I always wondered about that, which is why everyone played, tended to play German guitars, right? That's why everyone had Hofners, wasn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah but what, was the embar- you, what was that embargo exactly? Uh, you, you'd have to do some research. And once you find out, if you let This is my research, I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> it was some, yes, it was some stupid embargo. But anyway, what, what happened, therefore, we had to send to direct to the Fender factory and buy it direct. So we got the brochure and we looked through it and the most expensive guitar was the Stratocaster. And we'd already seen a photograph of Buddy Holly. So we knew that we didn't know what it was called, but that was the shape of the guitar he had. And we saw they had it in red with four plated hardware, bird's eye maple neck and, and a whammy, well, they call it a vibrato bar. So, um, no, tremolo arm, it's a vibrato bar really. Yeah. So that's what we ordered. And the color we're all convinced was down as flamingo pink. Oh. But we have constantly heard from Fender there was never any such color. And I heard from some guy who was doing a book recently, he sent me a lot of information and he's traced it back and it, it was some kind of red. Uh, that The color we, we think was pink was never apparently in their, in their toolbox at the time. So it was some, I'll, I'll have to look it up. If I, if I mean, I can so, so when this arrives, this box with, with this guitar in it, I mean, what an extraordinary thing to appear in the UK. To, yeah. uh, did, did people just gather? Did people come from miles around to stare at it? Oh, they would have done if we let it out of our sight. The thing was, you can imagine opening the, 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 the cardboard box and then you've got this tweed flat. Oh, yeah, so was it tweed? Guitar. Oh. You know, it's that tweed finish that we yeah. never see. And the flat case, we'd only ever seen guitar shaped cases. Open it up, red plush, sort of velvet lining. And this guitar looked like it just came in from Mars or somewhere. Yeah. It was it was a fantastic sight. You know, they're so commonplace now, we don't perhaps can't fully appreciate the impact that had in the flesh. Absolutely. But, I, but they still what, look like the future. They still look like the future, the Stratocaster. They, you know, they, it's yeah. an absolutely timeless. And a very versatile instrument too. I'll tell you one thing though, I couldn't believe. Uh, the guitar prior to that was a little cheap Antoria with a neck that was actually curved. So the action got, as you got to about the fifth fret, it was getting higher and higher, then got lower and lower. <laughs> but it did have a shorter scale than a, than a, I probably had a Gibson scale and you could actually bend the strings a little bit, the second string. In fact, in a couple of Cliff's early records, you, I, you can hear me bending quite easily. But with the Stratocaster, they were really heavy. And I, I found out later they came in with 13s to 56, like a 24 wound third. Wow. Well, that's that's where, you see, the whammy bar came in so useful. Because I have I found that I could only bend the second string up like half step. But if I pulled the whammy bar, if I set it up correctly, I could pull up another half. You know, give it a big pull up right. and yeah. not so much with the first string and a little bit with the third, but with that heavy third, you couldn't do much with it. And then of course you could dip the strings and you could get a lovely vibrato, make the guitar small, which was great. And you found your voice. This was your voice now, Hank. Yeah. Indeed it was, indeed it was. And um, it took me a while to get used to it, Gary, because I said with the heavy strings and eventually we went on to <clears throat> having Gibson Sonomatics when they became available at medium. So they were probably 12 to 52 maybe with a probably a 22 round third. So they weren't as heavy, a little easier to work with. Very few people can actually make strings sound interesting, Hank, but you you do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of you mentioned guys like David Gilmore and that. When you hear the way different guitarists approach music, that they, they might be using the same, in this case, a Strat, they can, the different sounds they can get out of it, the different approach, how it, it can become you mentioned the word before, right? like a voice. It's some, it's some, and I've noticed on recording, for example, uh, I usually use a cleaner sound, as you know, but now and again on on, on my albums, I've, I've used, and on stage, used a heavier sound, say on a solo or on part of the tune. 
you know, what I would call a mellifluous overdriven sound, it's a very sweet overdrive sound. And straight away, you start playing differently because now you've got a sustaining instrument and it, you start phrasing differently and everything. It's very interesting. You know, it's like suddenly yeah. going from being uh, Tiny Tim to Tom Jones. Because I remember once seeing you on TV with the Shadows and it was, and, and I can't remember you were playing one of your, your Apache or something. And then in the middle of it, you suddenly sort of kicked on some pedal or something and you went off on this sort of much more modern distorted sound. And, I, and it was, it blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and you then went back to your sound. <laughs> I mean, it was the sound of my youth in many ways, that, that guitar sound, the sound of, of Paul and John singing. Uh, these these are things that are very much about, you know, that were there in the soundtrack in my, in my life growing up and um, how did you feel because you guys were certainly rock and roll 100 you were you were the british version of, of american rock and roll for quite a few years and then suddenly the rolling stones come along and the beatles come along what did it feel like at that point for you it was an interesting period gary because what, what britain was still to a degree following the lead of the usa when we 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 first toured the USA in 1960, and we noticed that the stars on that package show, Frankie Avalon, Bobby Rydell, other people, they all they were all coming out wearing really either like a little bow tie, and and they were all, it was all cool, you know, it, all, all that sort of sweaty rock had gone, and we were, Cliff had this white shark suit, which looked fantastic, but we were doing more of a rock act, and when we came back, we thought, look, it's the scene is changing. Uh, you know, leather jackets and all that are passe now. So we started to move into wearing the suits with the little bow ties or a tie. So that, and, and then as you know, we started going into things like the movies and, and some of Cliff's uh, songs uh, after the early rock period, things like Living Doll and Traveling Light, there were, there were a gentler, softer approach to music. And on the one hand, we're getting away from the rock, but on the other hand, it expanded his audience enormously. I mean, it was just huge. Yeah. The change, from, you know, the, the audience we had before to now getting what we used to call mums and dads, you know. And when the, the, when the Beatles came on the scene, they still looked pretty smart. And we just thought, well, they've got a rawness to their music. And they're, rooted, they're heavily rooted in, in the, the rock stuff. You know, that's great, uh, which, which we all loved. And then when the, the Stones came on, again, they were wearing suits initially. And, and you know, they, they didn't look that different from yeah. what everyone was doing. And, of course, I fully understood things like uh, the early rock stuff, the Chuck Berry stuff, Little Red Rooster. It reminded me of when I was in listening to blues records, you know. So, But then you could see that there's a new generation coming along who are looking for their own heroes, and quite rightly, the Beatles were great, great songs. The Stones came along, different image. Then, of course, they ditched the suits. They were the rebels. I, I, did you ever read that that article by um, Andrew Lil Goldham, first the first manager of the Stones? We're hoping to have him on here, here, actually. <laughs> All right. Well, he, from what we heard, he, he said, "Look, Cliff and the Shadows are kind of clean. The Beatles are clean. The world needs some rebels." Yeah. yeah so yeah, he's ditched yeah, 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 yeah. the jeans, t-shirt, act, you know, act. act Badly disrespect for authority, get sure. plenty of publicity, and he's obviously right. Created a different image, but yeah, so we could see the scene changing, and that was good. Good for music, I think. You know, we'd had a good run, and uh, it's it's always good to see new talent coming on the scene. Because it was it wasn't it was like as as the, like nineteen sixty four say in the enemy poll, you still won best instrumental group, and that was whereas the Beatles took up that that was the real kind of change over year, wasn't it? Well, that's when everything was yeah. Interesting you mention that because I, I don't know if you know Bernie Marsden, Gary. The, the yes, artist. yeah, of course, Bernie. We know, yes, from White, we know White Bernie. Snake. Yes, he sent me. I don't know if you can see this. He sent me this the other day. Can you see this? Rhythm guitarist Bruce yes. Welsh. Oh yes, yes, lead guitarist Hank Marvin. Oh my yeah, God, Hank that. Marvin number one, <laughs> Jeff Beck number Jeff two, Beck. George Harrison number three, Keith Richards number four. Keith. Wow, but he's called Keith Richard here. Yeah, yes. he got confused. It's before he went plural. Thought, there was only one of him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was too schizophrenic. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo! You see, that is that's that says it all. That's yeah, why you. Yeah. That's that's why you're the best, Hank, yeah. and the biggest influence. I didn't even remember that. To be honest, I was quite surprised when I saw that. I've, but hey, but you know, I mean, talking about you know, talking about the iconography of the Red Strat. Ed Bicknell, who was Dire Straits manager, told me that the whole reason 
he managed dire straits was he was told to go and see them. And Mark Knopfler walked out with a red strap. He went, that's it. He said, if he hadn't been playing a red strap, he probably wouldn't have taken them on. <laughs> that's but, funny, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I mean, Cliff obviously never went out of fashion, really. He found a different market and, uh, and it was a very broad market and his success was incredible. And you wrote some great songs for him over the years. But I know, and I guess there must be, like there always is with, with in music, a slight disappointment that someone else has come along and stolen your crown. But eventually you guys got the credit you deserved, didn't you? Um, there, there was another time when people went, you know what, it was all about Hank, it was all about the shadows. Um, that's interesting you say that because when, when we got to, to the, towards the end of the 60s, I mean, we, as a band, we'd lost the creative juices, you know, a lot of bands. You were making albums, within... weren't you, rather than singles? Them, weren't you? Yeah, we still risk the odds single, but, you know, they, they, they might get the top... 30 or top 20, but nothing huge, mainly albums. But th th those creative juices had gone and we finally broke up, but we started to get back together in the, um, after the margin, excuse me, Marvin Walsh and Farrow period. Which is great, we, we love together. that, don't we? Oh, no, wait, wait, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> some great stuff to up there because this this blew my mind because obviously with the history as gary was saying with the shadows being the sound of um of our child we knew that from our childhood but then we also knew from 1977 when when you had that 20 golden greats and all that so which kind of fixed you and that's so the, the shadows sounded like the shadows you were always the shadows right that was then sort of re-fortified if you will in our memory but then to find out in 1970, you took this massive left turn and went full Laurel Canyon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because I've got to say, I love those albums. I mean, the I vocal really arrangements, the vocal arrangements They're on those amazing. albums between the three of you, you and and, and it was, this, it was this, called basically. Yeah, this, this is Marvin, Marvin Welsh and Farrar, which is, John Farrar. which is Hank and Bruce and this John Farrar, this Australian singer-songwriter who made two albums which were second of which was voted best sounding record by the engineers at abbey road wow <laughs> well you know they're all a little bit deaf <laughs> <laughs> john farrow's gone on to write some fabulous songs uh, with, with for olivia newton john and, and her record producer you know you're the one that i want uh hopelessly mm. devoted to you things like that and, and uh, have you never been mellow? All those great songs. Olivia's it's been everywhere great. with you guys as well, isn't she? Because you wrote that song for Cliff and Olivia, uh, The Day right. I Met Marie, which I think is absolutely a beautiful, incredible song. And so she was, she was pretty much uh, everywhere in the yeah. band. We, we wrote a song called uh, Sam, which she, she, I'd had this little oh, idea man. for, a, for a, you know, for a verse. I played it, John said, oh, I love that. Let's work on it. We played to Olivia and she said, oh, yeah, write it and we we couldn't finish the lyric we we had a little idea sam sam you know where i am if you ever need a friend that's it and that's about as far as it got and so uh about three years later john called me from the states and said that you know don black the um yeah the yeah we love don who's just written a fantastic memoir me. by the way has he indeed yeah it's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant john, john said would you mind if I asked him to finish the lyric? And I thought, well, hey, it's doing nothing, is it? So he finished it, so, and then she recorded it. And um, I've never heard a song that's less likely than a country and Western song. And it won country song of the year. It sounds like a Burt Bacharach song. It's got nothing to do with country. Yeah. Unless it's a uh, country of New York and Manhattan, maybe. <laughs> you did the Eurovision Song Contest, I remember, with uh, on the Lulu yeah. show. You were on, it, on the Lulu show, which was huge. Lulu was huge. Lulu still is huge. She should be on this show. We should get her on. Um, and and you you did a different song every week, I remember. Do you know, it's, it's funny. How old were we then? 34, 33, 34. Um, we, we did a, a BBC news, one of those early evening news shows with, I think it was Anne Diamond, someone like that. And chatting away, all friendly before the show, we're sitting there and then on the air. Well, the shadows will be representing Great Britain in the Eurovision Song Contest. But now, boys, aren't you too old for this sort of thing? Aren't <laughs> 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 you too old? What? Yeah. yeah, were you the oldest man in rock? <laughs> hey, we, we might be, are we? No, 
uh, wait a minute, no, uh, Bill Wyman would be, wouldn't he? Well, Not, you're, you're, you're younger yeah, because than... you're actually you were actually very, the youngest of your generation, though, weren't you? I mean, you were really young. He's younger young. than John Lennon. John Lennon would, was already yeah. eighty. John Lennon was old, was I think a little bit older than the Cliff. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, Bill Wyman, of course, must be about one hundred and ten. But you were kids. You were seventeen when you started. But but what it, what I'm interested in as well is this comeback when you become, you know. I mean, people forget, I certainly forgot, but doing some research for this, I was reminded that you and Cliff did that 30-year anniversary tour together. Yes. And you played two nights headlining at Wembley Stadium in 1988-89. Unbelievable. How, what was that like? Sudden, you know, you're still wanted by that many people. And there were a lot of young faces out there. Yeah. Oh, it was beautiful because it, also, fortunately, the weather was perfect for both those nights. Uh, well, one thing that stood out for me on that performance was uh, we were playing just as it was getting dusk when we did our the shadow set. And we did a couple of the up-tempo hits. And then I think we did Shadoogi, which always gets the crowd, you know, rocking. And I introduced uh, the theme from the deer hunter, Cavatina. But as soon as we started to play there was this beautiful hush and just people just swaying and it, it was a very moving experience because you could hear the the guitar ringing out through the the stadium you know wow. and the summer it was just oh. art it was very moving i had a tear in my eye was that that one of that one no. but it was but it was beautiful <laughs> could we just i just want to go back a little bit because of this whole when you said doing the deer hunter when you had this reset because again doing this research i was reminded that um because when you released 20 Golden Greats, which was one of the first TV ab in, advertised during Coronation Street, uh, which was an immediate million seller. And I remember when I, as soon as I saw that album cover, of course, now it's on Spotify as The Shadows 50 Golden Greats. Um, oh. But seeing that, that, that cover, that, that graphic of the three, the shadow of the three guitar yeah. necks, and suddenly I realized that's such a fixed thing, that's as iconic as like Dark Side of the Moon or something. Absolutely. An absolutely fixed memory of that. That was such a big record. Oh, brilliant. And that's bizarre. when you, you decided to come back doing those instrumentals. Yeah, well, yes. And we, we hadn't really got back together on a permanent basis. You know, we made a couple of albums and we did the Eurovision Song Contest, did some gigs around that time in, in which we incorporated some Marvel Watch and Farisoff and the Shadows uh, music. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was it until that album was released. But from my standpoint, interestingly, I, I got to the stage in the early 70s and I, I didn't really want to, want to sound like me anymore. You know, I thought it was old fashioned. And then we did the John Peel show when we were getting together before we did the, uh, the Rockin' with Curly Leeds album. That was fantastic to find that out, that you were championed by John Peel. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, he said, look, guys, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, you know, he said, at the end of the 60s, he said, I've always been a fan of the Shads, but it was very uncool to say that you like the Shadows as, as it got towards the end of the 60s. He said, but I tell you what, it's becoming cool again. He said, you'd be surprised the amount of people who come in here and say, ah, oh, Shads, they were great. That's how I start to play. And he said, yeah. it's kicking off again. And he was right. And, yeah. and that gave me the confidence to, and another guy called Alan Tarney, you know, Alan, who was uh, for uh, the Cliff, like we don't talk anymore. He did. Yeah, Aha. no, I know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yes, 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 yes. Well, lovely bass player, Alan. And he, in fact, played in Marvel Marshall. Yes, Farrah. of course. Yeah. And he, he said to me around that time, he said, he, he said, Hank, go back to your sound. He said, it, it's a distinctive voice. And he said, it, he said, just don't leave it. Go back to it. And he, he gave me a lot of serious persuasion. So between him and John Peel, I decided to pick up the old Strat and get the Echo Box on again and yeah. twang notes. You played with Jean-Michel Jarre for a bit as well, didn't you, Hank? Yeah, well, yes. He he. Um, how that came about was we we did a version of um, uh, Equinox or part whatever you know several parts, mm -hmm. and he sent us a beautiful letter saying how grateful we are so <laughs> we recorded it because he was a big Shads fan, you see, and we thought nothing of it, and then. Um, he contacted my management to say he wanted me to record a track on his new album and if I was available to do the Docklands concert. So that happened. And when we did the concert, he, he brought out some photographs of him at the age of 15 as the lead guitarist in the Shadows band, which I thought was quite funny. I had no idea he even played guitar. And yeah, so we did the so we did the the concert at Docklands, and then I did um I did a show with him in Paris 
uh, it was the, the 100th anniversary of the Eiffel Tower. And we did, uh, I can't even remember what we did. I think it was the London Kid. I think that's what it was called. Because when you think of someone so different, we think as this sort of big electronic soundscape guy, but but for someone like him, you would have been the model for sort of someone making instrumental records. That's right. That's Possibly. But as I say, he, he was in a Shadows band when he was younger, so there was yeah. a connection. But um, And his father, of course, was a famous uh, film composer, wasn't he? Ah. So, Hank, we were talking at the beginning about your influence on other guitar players, and, and there was an album that came out in, in 98 called Twang, a tribute to Hank Marvin and the Shadows. And, and this is the list of guitar players that played your music. Uh, Richie Blackmore, Brian May, Tony Iommi, Steve Stevens, Peter Green, Neil Young, Mark Knopfler, Peter Frampton, Keith Urban, Andy Summers. I mean, you know, these all want to be you. And uh, um, Neil Neil Young actually wrote a song, didn't he, on on uh, Harvest Moon album in the nineties called "From Hank to Hendrix," and he talks about how, how his guitar was everything to him. And that's because that's from growing up in Canada, wasn't it? Because in Canada, you were particularly big. Yeah, it was a bit of a cult in America. We never quite had the uh, had the success in the states because we we quite simply couldn't get our records promoted. They, the record company said, no, it's, you're just copying American music and the story. So it was always um, a losing battle to try to get anything happening there, you know? But hey. Your pride. That mean, you must be proud of that, that legacy. Yes. Yes, I, I would say that. Uh, look, it was for a long time, Gary, that we, we didn't really appreciate, I think. Um, we, we, look, we appreciated the success we had. And, um, and the, the fact that we were involved in the music industry in such a big way that was beyond our dreams however we didn't fully appreciate the impact that our music had had on a whole generation until we saw either met people in the flesh like say Brian May or Peter Townsend people like that and they would say how much that meant to them and maybe that was one reason why they picked up a guitar in the first place uh, so once yeah. I became aware of that, I felt extremely flattered, but also more and more convinced that people are gullible. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh self-deprecating to the last. Uh, there you go. But because it's funny, because the, the, then you you because you now play gypsy jazz as your thing now, right? Well, yeah, it's 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 more a bit of fun than anything else. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy it because it's it's fun music to play, and it's um it's a real challenge, you know, because it's obviously not my primary. Uh, background in music um and, and we do it you're up against of, the, you're up against the guy with two and a half fingers that's the real challenge <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but do you play guitar all the time now still hank you, you, do, is it still something you pick up and play well, you've got your studio I, I, you know it's interesting guy through the 60s i didn't practice at all the only time i'd use the guitar was to write and to learn the new numbers and arrange when you know you prepare for an album yeah. <laughs> but I, I didn't improve I don't think I didn't improve from probably the age of about 18 to probably when I was in my 30s uh, and then I started to, to, to view things a little differently and think I, I think I might want to put some more effort into this you know it's about time I did so now I try to I listen to other people um, I'm a great believer in in listening to other musicians guitarists sax players pianists and, and trying to draw on what they do. Um, you know, I think we can all learn from each other. And so I do try to practice a lot more now, um, just uh, technique practice and learning, just getting ideas for improvisation, how to approach different chord sequences and so forth. What is weird is going from a gypsy jazz guitar back to a Strat. For a start, it's a longer scale. It's a 26 and a half inch scale. All right. And the other thing is the dot on the ninth fret on a Strat, on an American guitar, is not the same on a gypsy guitar. And when I first got a gypsy guitar, every time I went, went up the neck, I thought, why am I playing in a different key? I must be losing it. Then it took me three weeks to realize the ninth fret dot is actually on the 10th fret on a gypsy guitar. <laughs> Guy and I were having a chat before this, and we're def we're concerned about, about that first red Strat, aren't we? Where it, yes. where it lives, are, yeah, we're, and we're, who actually we're, we're, owns yeah, it. Exactly. And <laughs> Right. We, don't know, well, we don't know if, if we can talk about this or... <laughs> the story, the, the story, uh, the real story 
Um, Bruce has had this guitar since or around 1968. He borrowed it and he never gave it back. Now he's, he kept saying, Cliff gave me the guitar. And when we did the Cliff and the Shads reunion tour, Brian Bennett and I said, let's get to the bottom of this. Because Cliff had said to me, Hank, I did not give it to him. I lent it to him. He didn't give me it back. He said, if I'm oh. going to give it to you, and I'll give it to you, you see. So, and this is worth a fortune, it. right? <laughs> yeah. This, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, even of- just even just as a red 59 Strat is worth a fortune, let alone, you know. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, anyway we, we after dinner, we started to, no, Bruce, what is the real story? And eventually he came out with it. No, he said, actually, he said, Cliff did lend it to me. I never gave it to him back. So I said, okay. And this gets back to my running gag. So you stole it, did you? Well, yes, I did. So, do you know what I did? What does Cliff I say? Oh, he just thinks it's funny. <laughs> but th- does no one think perhaps it should be in your possession if it's going to be anywhere? Well, Cliff thought so, yeah, but it, 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 it doesn't bother me that much, Guy, quite honestly. You know, if it, it makes Bruce happy. Well, it bothers us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but does Cliff own it, do you think, Hank, who actually owns it? He does, he does own it, yeah. That's pretty yeah, Cliff's, got the rec- Cliff's got the receipt, right? <laughs> yeah, he's not going to take it back. <laughs> when, Cliff, when Cliff gave me the guitar originally, he actually gave it to me. But when we were given our own Stratocasters and, and the Fender bass, once that embargo was lifted, you know, we, we, we all got matching big guitars. I gave it back to Cliff. I thought, well, that's the decent thing to do, give it back to him. In those days, they didn't mean so much, did they? We had Johnny Marr on. He was saying they weren't vintage guitars then. They were just old guitars. Yeah, they were just old guitars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was two years old. So I've, I've actually got a 58 Strat around here somewhere. No, it's in the studio. And um, my, my signature model Strats are all um, based on that 59 Strat and my 58 Strat. And even the body. It's funny, when, when the guy from the custom shop was looking at the body, he said, wow. He said, that body's really sensuous, isn't it? It's all curvy. He said the new ones are all a bit kind of chunky. You know, they don't have that lovely flowing yeah, sound yeah. Dali curve. Yeah, I've got a 57. And, I've got a 57. And uh, and it has exactly that. It's it's beautifully plain, or, or it doesn't have the, the fatness of the, la- the heaviness of the later guitars. What color is yours, Gary? It's uh, it's Sonic Blue. Sonic? The original blue. color, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I love those colours they came up with. <laughs> but they were because they're, they're car colours, aren't they? Because the original workshop was next door to a body shop, so all the original fenders are just car colours. They were paint car paint. Exactly, really? and apparently that yeah. red colour was a car paint. I, I must find out what it was and let you know. Anyway, yeah. excellent. And, what's, and Australia, Hank, what what prompted that move? Is that something? Oh, it was a typing error. We we we. <laughs> 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 He's meant to be going to Austria. <laughs> no, you're actually going to Perth in Wales. <laughs> <laughs> or Scotland or wherever it is. Oh, yeah, Scotland. No, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. It, no, quite honestly, we've we, we just been thinking about moving out of the UK for a while. Uh, somewhere that we're, we're less people and better weather. And uh, we were building a house to Menorca and found out that Unfortunately, there were no English speaking schools and our youngest was then 11. Our youngest daughter was 13, we thought, oh, wrong. And I said to Carol, my, my wife, I said, look, um, you know, we could go, let's go to Australia because they can al- almost speak English there, so there's no problem. And, and, <laughs> and we had so many Australian friends and uh, in both in the UK and in Australia. So we ended up, we said, look, let's, we sold the house in Menorca. Let's go to Perth. It's relaxed, great beaches lots of space, Mediterranean climate. And one day I'll get free tickets to see Spandau Ballet. And you did, and he came to see us <laughs> hey! 10 years ago and he came backstage and it was what an honor. I was, everyone was speechless. They could, it was Hank Marvin was in the dressing room and, uh, and it was a wonderful thing. That, that was a good show, Gary. That I was really impressed with the band. I thought you were tight. You know, it was, it was Thank solid, you. it was good. Thank it, you. Was really good. Uh, it was much better than I expected. Hank. Because Lionel, Lionel told me you're crap. <laughs> <laughs> Hank, may 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 I just have one wish that you never discover contact lenses. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, never get never get lasered. <laughs> Your glasses. I, I mean, you look so well. You look so healthy. Long may you reign, sir, as, oh, as the champion of the Stratocaster that we all know you are. 
the Guitar Hero's Guitar Hero. I mean, really. Excellent. absolutely. It's look, it's been a pleasure to talk with you guys. It really has, and um, I, I'm I'm so pleased that you're you're so easily impressed because it makes my life so much. <laughs> Give my love to Bruce, or I'll give your love because I see Bruce occasionally, and uh, uh, at, at, at some songwriting event that we go to, um, and uh, and Cliff as well. And are you any plans to get back together? What is the plan? Any plan? I, I don't think so. Uh, I think we're too old, to be honest. Um, you know, oh, look at the reunion tour we did was great. It, it was good personally on a personal level for all of us to do that after so long, and particularly for Bruce and I. And I think that, and it was, it was so successful musically and commercially, and I think it would be downhill after that. You know, would, would we be as good? Could I still do break dancing while I'm playing Apache? Probably not. <laughs> we never even mentioned the dancing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I must say, I, I've, I, I, the, the only, probably the only move that I've learned and used repeatedly throughout my career is your original four step. Of course, you do that too, don't you, Guy? You do. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do the shadows four step. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Lots of love. Thank you, you so both. much. And hopefully, you when we, hopefully we'll get to come down and play in Perth together yeah. with the Sultan of Secrets. I'd love to see that, yeah. Oh. Thanks, guys. Um, wow. Well, yeah. that was Hank. <laughs> Such a nice man. Yeah, and I get What I'm a lovely man. So thrilled when I met him in Perth. And of course, we do have that. that yeah, you had something... that. You had that all saved up for the end. I was so you... jealous. Well, what I was going to say in the intro, but you so rudely went to the show, <laughs> was I was going to say that what does Hank Marvin, Jimmy Page, and Gary Kemp all have in common, a apart from the fact that we play a, a six string guitar? And uh, to varying degrees of ability. Um, Who knew Gary Kemp could play like that? Yeah. <laughs> and the answer was a bloke called Lionel Ward, who was was Hank's oh, guitar tech, see. my guitar tech, and he's currently Jimmy and my tech. guitar and tech. And he was well, he my was... guitar tech for Pink Floyd when uh, we did Nebworth in 1990. Really? Yes, so that's how it... I met him. That's, that's how I ended up yeah. playing with Jimmy Page, was hey. through Lionel. Wow. There you go. Yeah. So, so Lionel and and Lionel actually got Hank helped to get Hank on this show today. So I want to say thank you to Lionel Ward, the great the the guitar tech, guitar tech, guitar tech, <laughs> guitar tech. Um, that was Everything, great every, everything's definitive about this show. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Uh, we're on all the podcast channels every week. I think that was episode twenty something. Four hundred and seventy five. But but what guy and I know, and you don't is how great we've how many great people we've got coming up we have yeah, really got yeah. some great names lined up now and we're very excited about that and thank you all so much for making the show the success that it is and it's brilliant we love all your comments and so keep that coming and we'll see you next week good night from her and it's good night from this one 